Hi guys, today I'm speaking with Susie Krabacher, who has done something very dear to my heart, but it's also something that is very difficult to hear about. This is some of the most uh, touching, but also excruciating detail you'll ever hear and view on this channel. But this is something that I feel really passionate about and I feel needs to be brought to light. If you want to believe it or go about your day and think that everything is just fine, okay, that's the way you live your life. But I really want to save these children. You know what, Susie, why didn't we start by you telling me about the situation around child sacrifice? I imagine it's to do with voodoo and things in Haiti. It's definitely to do with voodoo. Um, I, I think the best way to explain it to you without being absolutely... Um, <laughs> I'm going to try to do it in a, in a way that you can understand without having actually experienced or seen it. It is to do with voodoo. It, uh, it, it's said that blood, um, gives power. And especially if it is a firstborn child, um, the power of that blood is supposedly stronger and oh it's gosh. done more for political purposes. So if, say, for example, you are the president of a country and you, you're having an election, um, in February. Well, and, and this has happened. Um, I, I ran the, uh, the abandoned baby unit inside the government hospital for 14 years. So, um, one particular incident was a young woman came in, healthy woman, gave birth to a child on January 31st and um, the, she was told her child had passed away. However, all of a sudden in my abandoned baby unit, I had a new brand new baby boy and um, it was healthy. And I always watch very carefully the healthy children because they tend to disappear. They are <clears throat> usually um, the nurses at the hospital have a deal with an orphanage or orphanages that when a healthy baby is born, they will call the orphanage and say, we have a healthy one. It's newborn. What do you want to pay me for it? So they'll start a bidding on that child. Well, I didn't know that there was a ritual for political purposes of sacrifice for a child born, a firstborn child that was healthy. Um, so this particular January 31st, this child came to me and I, I knew within a few days the child would likely disappear. So, I really told my staff, I want you to pay attention to this. Well, my staff also had deals with orphanages, so I didn't really trust them, but it was the best that I could do. To Oh my god. So I um I went to the the abandoned baby unit um after going home, the next morning I go back to the abandoned baby unit and that baby is gone. I I went to the morgue. I couldn't find the child, so I knew something had happened to the child. I always go straight to the morgue to see, because they always say, oh, it's mort. It's dead. That, you know, that's what happened to it. And, uh, so my ritual was always to go to the morgue and, and ask me about that later because I want to tell you, um, what I have found in the morgue that shows evidence of, uh, organ har harvesting in Haiti. So months later, I was reading the, um, um, I think, I think it was called the Sun Sentinel. Um, it, it's a Florida newspaper. Lo and behold, on, um, the night that child disappeared and this woman was told her baby was dead, there was a priest that held a ritual with a certain president who was mentioned in that article. The priest actually gave his name and told of the how it was done. Okay, so this was actually in the paper. This guy um, was the guy who t was telling the story was present 
with the priest, the voodoo priest, the he said there were two women um, present in this home in Port-au-Prince, and it was a sacrifice for power for the president to win the re-election. The article tells that the child was... Do you want me to tell you this or not? I, I don't know. If I, I, think, I think so, yeah. I think we need to know, you know okay. the extent of this. So the child um, was put in a very large mortar and crushed, and the fluids were drained, and um, they all drank the fluids from um, the strained flesh. And this was supposedly to win the election, which this president did win the election. And, and does this because I guess I'm just thinking about what people you know listening to this they'll just be saying oh come on this just sounds no. like one of, do, do you know what I mean so the, you're I saying, this is in the I thought the, Sun the same Sentinel. thing I I worked in that hospital for 14 years and yes I know that there uh, is organ trafficking I under I understand that as a fact because I witnessed the the um, results of of the, the the children's corpses in the morgue. And one um, of my own was a victim of that practice. So as as far as this story, I didn't really believe it either. Um, I thought it was sensational. So I started my own um, investigation. I started talking to, I, I even went to the voodoo mambas in our village. And I'm going to tell you right now, any Haitian who is practicing voodoo, um, especially here in the U.S., are going to deny that this happens. I got nailed when I wrote my book, Angels of a Lower Flight, because I spoke of this stuff. Well, my um, my social media blo- blew up with a group of uh, practicing mambas, which is a voodoo priestess, um, from New York saying, you know, this is a lie, you know, voodoo is sacred, we worship our ancestors, it has nothing to do with that. It's not true. So I started talking to, I have 100, at that time I had 165 employees, now I have 123. Every one of my employees um, has a story of a baby in their village disappearing on a certain political uh, event, and I don't think that a hundred, over a hundred people would tell different stories with the same theme separately. Um, I've talked to some of my children who have grown up and, and moved out of my orphanage who are now living in villages and asked them, you know, can you talk to me about what you've seen? Do you, have you seen babies disappear and can you explain that to me? Well, um, talk about sensational and it is very sensational voodoo runs through the veins of society in haiti and it's a religion of fear okay so as as i started going to the morgue more and more to investigate um disappearances of babies i started when the when the morgue um director i would ask him to please go and and look and see if he had any new babies that had been brought in during the time of disappearances so i took my um my camera back then we did not have cell phones so i took my camera and i took a picture of the log book of the morgue and you know babies 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 and besides each entry cause of death is uh, Lagaru. And I'm like, okay, they all died of Lagaru disease. So I went and um, I, I'm going to get ready to tell you. I went and, and asked my employees, you know, I, what is Lagaru disease? And they said, oh, it's not a disease. That means werewolf. They all died mm. of werewolf. So in the voodoo culture, they believe that a bad person can turn into a werewolf, steal your baby, and this is so crazy. 
This is so crazy, but this is facts. Th- these are facts. You mm. can read um, a book called Travesty in Haiti. Um, you can uh, re- it, it, it's phenomenal some of the, the the things that have been written about these sorts of incidences. Um, if we we you should go- probably explain what what you're doing out in Haiti in the first place, the yeah. work you do, and, and that kind yeah. of stuff. Okay, so my husband and I started working in Haiti in 1994. I went down there, like so many do, to volunteer, um, to do a mission, maybe feed some poor people, hold some babies, and feel good about myself. Um, I went by myself because I'm not one that likes to do tours or hang out in buses with large groups of people. So I just went by myself and asked when I got to my hotel, um, could I get a driver and go to where the poor people are? And I had some, um, some little bit of cash, um, not much, but I thought, you know, I'll just go pass out some dollar bills to these homeless poor people. Well, m- my driver actually took me to the poorest slum in Haiti called City Soleil. Uh, it's very well-known slum in the Western Hemisphere, also very well-known for voodoo. My driver got there, and it started getting a little dark, so I went back to get in the cab or whatever you want to call it, and he had left. So I was stuck there, um, didn't speak Creole, But back then, the UN was in Haiti. They were occupying Haiti. So a lot of the littler kids were learning English. And City Soleil was occupied by the UN at that time. So a young boy, about 14, took me by the hand and, you know, explained, um, you can stay with my family if you want. So I spent the night with his family, um, got up the next morning, and it was like the exodus like in the Bible, there must have been, I would say, 10,000 or more people just moving away from the slums into the city. And I thought I would just follow them to hopefully find a car with my little friend who had adopted me to help me find a car to get back. And I said, where are all these people going? He said to look for food. So I I found a ride, got back to the hotel, Um I started thinking, you know, with this little bit of cash, you know, I could probably feed a hundred of these people. I called my husband and we talked about it. He said I could stay. Uh, I, I, I had, I fibbed a little bit. I told him that I had lost my passport and that I had to stay, but I didn't really lose my passport, but I didn't think he'd let me stay. So lo and behold, I stayed for about a month and, um, started a little program in the slum where we just fed beans and rice to the children. We found a little building. It cost me $20 a month to rent it. It was clean and I, it was easy to find beans and rice and to find people to cook it. That's quite, um, quite a remarkable thing. You, you guys just did that on your own. You just went and you just set up like a a kitchen and and serve food to all these people. That's pretty remarkable. It was, it really wasn't very hard to be honest with you. Um, this little friend of mine, um, Marcelin was his name. He became, you know, like my third arm. He was with me everywhere. I started, um, meeting with him every day. He showed me where to buy beans and rice. He showed me some, um, little old women who wanted a job. I hired them to boil water and cook rice and beans and, uh, bought some paper plates and we started. So I went back home after a month. I hired a director. Um, I was paying him at the time, I think, $75 a month and asked him to run the programs. And I would just come back every after I raised money back home. I would come back every other month. I'd raise money, then go back, raise money. And it started um, raising money to feed the poor was not very hard. It really came very natural for people to want to help. So within six months, we had over 500 children we were feeding, and then the problems began. (laughs) Um, The gangs were very active, and I was feeding mostly their children and didn't know it, but eventually they said, well, you have to feed us too. And I really didn't want to do that. 
But I was explained by my little 14-year-old friend that if you don't feed them, they won't protect you anymore. And I didn't even why, realize... Why did you not want... Why well, because I didn't to, want to uh, feed... To I didn't want to feed criminals. Um, you know, these people were the same people who were raping women and um, killing each other, putting each other's heads on poles um, to scare each other. And uh, I just really didn't want to feed them, but... Plus, once you get involved, you know, even helping them, you know, then it's it's already... But by that point, you are inadvertently involved because you, mm-hmm. you now realize you're feeding, you've been feeding their children. Mm-hmm. So the kids were starving. I didn't feel at all... Um, I, I knew I was doing the right thing by feeding those kids. However, when my little friend Marcelin said, you have to feed them for protection. And um, I, I, I didn't know I was being protected. You know, I was quite arrogant about the fact that, oh, they think they're protecting me. You know, and I realized it was true. Um, I started having my, my food stolen. I started having, um, my employees harassed, um, threatened with rape on the way home. So I started feeding them. It was the lesser of two evils. Uh, there were 40 that I agreed to feed on a daily basis, but it was protection. And my husband's a lawyer. We, uh, we agreed early on that we would never pay bribes because it's illegal and I didn't want to go to jail for something like that. So food for protection, that seemed reasonable. After uh, about 18 months of going back and forth, I realized that a lot of the kids had uh, were dying from things like malaria, AIDS, um, typhoid. And I wondered what, you know, how could we get them medical care? Not being a, a doctor or, you know, and never, I, I went, I, I graduated 10th grade. I didn't know anything about health care or nutrition, really. Um, so they said, well, there's a hospital called the General Hospital. The acronym for that is H-U-E-H. And they said, that's where we go when we have to, but we have to bribe the doctors and then we have to pay for our medicine and then we have to to uh, buy our own needles and our own gauze and bring uh, uh, our own sheets and our own water. So I thought, well, you know what, maybe I can go to that hospital and I could buy the medicine for the people and the needles and um so I went. I went with Marcelin and we we got to uh the door of the hospital and the guard said, you know, what's your business? And Marcelin said, Oh, she's a missionary. Um and I got in. So I spent the the whole day inside of the hospital in the pediatric unit and there were so many babies that um, the mothers would be sitting there with a piece of paper with a, that was a prescription and crying because they couldn't fill the prescription. So I just went around and I took all of the pieces of paper out of their hands and I asked Marcelin to go with me to find places to buy these medicines. And they sell antibiotics on the street. You don't really even need a prescription. They sell AIDS medicine on the street, um, syringes, you know, and right outside the hospital, there were uh, street markets that sold all these things because people had to go from the hospital and buy them. So it was really easy to find. So I bought two or $300 worth of this stuff and uh, the IV bags, the saline solution, and told the doctors that I would pay for the medicines if they would administer the medicines. Well, they wanted a bribe. So um, I said, well, I can't do that, but I can hire you. So mm. I hired some of the doctors that were working for the hospital. That was wow. a brilliant idea, if I must say, because they started actually treating the patients. They weren't treating the patients before because they said they weren't getting paid enough. And um, so they would show up to work at seven in the morning and they'd leave at 10. And I, I said, would, if, if I paid you a hundred dollars a month, would you work all day and treat these patients? And they started doing it. 
So it became valuable to the hospital um, and very well liked by the doctors. And I just spent all my time in that hospital and stopped going to the slums because the slum was running itself. They didn't need me anymore as long as I was paying for the food and the rice. So I became obsessed with this hospital and saving these babies. It was, it was just it was wonderful. I was truly saving lives. And the babies would start going home healthy. And one day I was sitting holding a newborn who had AIDS and I was playing with its fingers and just, you know, it was quiet in the hospital. And I was enjoy- enjoying this baby. And all of a sudden I, I thought I heard something like, um, dogs howling. And, you know, I thought, oh, well, it must be some, hungry dogs and I love dogs so of course I went to find where the crying was coming from and it sounded like it was coming from the back of the hospital near the morgue and I opened this door and it was really dark inside it took some time for my eyes to adjust and there was a very very dim uh, light coming in from under another door no windows and these howls turned out to be but it was all children and they were all disabled children um, of various what? ages yeah they were all disabled children and um, the oldest might have been 14 15 um, but he you could see every bone in his body and he ha- didn't have any teeth um, and then I started looking around and there was one little boy his name was Henri. Um, I named him Henri later. And he's, he's 29 now, but at that time he was about two, we think. And he was jumping up and down in his crib and he was, you know, trying to get my attention. And I looked at what he was playing with. I thought somebody had given him a doll and it was actually a deceased little baby that he was playing with. I went over oh my and. God. I took the child and I laid it against the wall, you know, so because I didn't want him playing with it. And uh, I was so, I think I was just in shock because I was trying to figure out, was I supposed to be in here? And why were these people in here, these children and um, older um, people, you know, the, the older kids? And they were naked. One little girl, um, I named her Sandalini, and this little girl was laying in a crib with iron slats with no uh, mattress. And I, she was screaming. I mean, that's where all the howling was coming from. She was screaming in agony and was exhausted from, str- str- you know, just ex- her breath was, you know, like this. And every breath, there was a scream. So I thought I'd pick her up and, you know, comfort her. When I picked her up, there was sort of a, a hesitance. And I put her against, I put her against my chest and then realized that my hand hit the back of her head and sunk into the back of her head because the flesh had grown to the metal bars. And when I lifted her, it literally tore off the scalp. And I took that baby and walked to the pediatric section of the hospital. And I said, you got to come with me, come, come with me. And I was, I was was telling the doctors that you got to come with me and see these, these children. And they, they explained, no, 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 those are cocoa bays. We don't take care of cocoa bays. No. I said, I'll pay you. They said, no, we do not take care of cocoa bays. I didn't know what a cocoa bay was. I assumed that it meant crazy children, um, because they were all acting crazy, you know, screaming and, um, naked and so I just stayed that night I sent Marcelin out to get a lot of water um, to get me some diapers some any kind of um, any kind of salve salve that he could find um, something with antibiotic in it and I just 
held him and I felt horrible about what I did to Sandalini and um, I, I determined the next day that I would find someone, I would take her into the pediatric unit and make it seem like she didn't come from that room, that she was in a Coco Bay, that she was just a new arrival. Because what, what is Coco Bay? It, it means less than human um, because they were handicapped children. Every one of them had a handicap. So that's, I found out later why they were put in that room, because in the voodoo religion, a uh, deformity is a curse that someone put on you or the mother um, while, while the child was in gestation. So you have to get rid of it. And that's where people get rid of their um, disabled children. Or in some villages, they... Um, I, I have another young man that we've raised um, who was a Coco Bay, and my husband and I found him uh, in the mountains above our, our orphanage. He was tied to a tree, and he was probably six or seven, and he, naked, filthy, covered in mud. I couldn't even tell if it was a boy or a girl at first. He was so emaciated, and his genitals were utterly unrecognizable um we took him down to our orphanage and cleaned him up and we've raised him and uh he is now i think he's 14 now but th this is the the practice of euthanization of disabled children is very common in haiti i'm not talking like they inject them with anything or smother them they it's euthanization by um withdrawal of nutrition and um and usually water so we started realizing that that room that i found that, that those children had been put there and not fed or given water for who knows how long um and they were being euthanized so i went to the office of the director of the hospital he was actually a, a pretty decent man um just had you know he, he, his culture was um does this so when i explained to him that these children were locked in this room he knew and he explained again that those children are abandoned, they're Cocoa Bays, we can't take care of them, we don't have the assets to take care of them, and I asked, could I please take care of them? And um, he said, oh, sure. Didn't take me very seriously. He's like, oh, sure. Well, after several months, those kids were starting to get better. And by... Eight months after I discovered them, there were now 57 children abandoned in that place. So I needed to get, um, he wouldn't let me give them medicine, and he would only let me give them a little water and a little food. But he said, if you're going to feed them, you have to feed all of the pediatric unit. He goes, it's not fair for you just to feed them, and I don't want you giving them medicine because they're not to live. And he... he um, explain that to me but of course i hired a doctor inside the hospital and said they're not gonna be coco bays if you treat them would you treat them and i will show you that they will get well some of them you know simply were crazy because they hadn't been treated well they'd been beaten or caged all their life so wow. I, this doctor, I ended up hiring him um, full time away from the hospital. I, I negotiated with the hospital that I would pay them thirteen hundred dollars a month, which is a fortune in Haiti, if they would give me the room that I found those kids with and let me put windows, a toilet, a kitchen, and set it up as something nice. So they loved the idea of the money and they let me do it. I started hiring my own nurses and my own doctors and the kids started getting better. Um, some of them did pass away. Sandalini passed away. Um, 
but 57 children went home with me eventually. My husband and I took out a mortgage on our home and bought a home, a very large home in Port-au-Prince, and started raising them. Um, most of those kids are still with me today. Wow. Uh, they're, in their, they're in their late 20s, most of them now. Um, but they're, they are disabled. They are either mentally retarded or they can't uh, walk. You know, some of them have... Uh, congenital heart diseases, but we take such good care of them that they're, they're, they're really thriving. We have a physical therapy center, uh, state of the art that some wealthy people uh, built for us, um, here in Colorado. They gave us the money. We built it. We're now treating the entire village, um, of handicapped children in Haiti, but, I want to go back to the issue of the child sacrifices. Mm. Well, well you, first, can I can I just I just want to say firstly that I'm just you know I'm amazed by what you guys have done. I, it's just the, the most remarkable thing, and uh, you deserve a lot of credit for that. Um, I, I also just want to ask. I mean, do you do you have I suppose you know pictures of of some of the some of the things because I'm, I'm just concerned that yes. people are going to get in touch, just like you said they will when you wrote your book saying yep. what are you talking about and all this stuff if you got, oh, they you got will. some of that stuff they will mm. um did did i send you the photographs of my t my time in the morgue with the children who had been uh, um Stern Magazine, which is a European uh, magazine that's somewhat like Time Magazine or Life Magazine i I was in Haiti um, in, I think it was 1999 or maybe 2000, still doing my work. And a Time magazine journalist was doing a story on orphanages. And somehow he found out about me, tracked me down. And I said, you know, orphanages is not a story here. Oh, I'm you just should follow the pictures now. Uh, yeah, oh, I said, you, you should follow me for a day. <laughs> And he, he said, are you for real? I said, I'm for real. Follow me for a day. First day, I took him directly to the morgue, and I showed him. There must have been 200 little children's bodies stacked like loaves of bread. They're, I mean, I'm talking to you graphically because I am living this. And when I tell people, they don't believe it. I am living this. So if you want to believe it or go about your day and think that everything is just fine, okay. That's the way you live your life. But I really want to save these children. So I took him, and he went in with me to the first. There's uh, three sections of the morgue. One is for children. And one is for men and one is for women. So I took him to the one with the children. There is no refrigeration because there's no electricity. And they only clean the morgue out once a month. And we went through body by body and I showed him the, but this, this is, this is, it's almost ins unspeakable because when we were looking through those bodies, I found my son, Jerry, who I thought an orphanage had taken him. My, my uh, employees told me that an orphanage had taken him and he was, cause he was a healthy little three year old. And I just, I believed them and I was happy. Okay. Yes, he got sold, but he'll end up with some wonderful, you know, foreign family. So I was happy for him. But while we were looking, um, through and I was showing this, um, this Time magazine journalist who he was a freelancer. He was taking pictures and he was there when I found Jerry. Jerry had incisions on his back where um, your kidneys would be and he was a perfectly healthy child so the photographer took a picture um, I took Jerry out of there because I 
wanted to give him a proper burial. And we did that. Um, but that's all on film. I also have the video. Um, he took videos. So I have those uh, living pictures of those couple hours in the I morgue. I suppose, um, I, I get, you know, so, so that, I suppose, is evidence of a lot of child mortality. Do, did you do you have that kind of evidence of of that, you know that they were sacrificed or, or organs trafficked? The organs were definitely missing. Um, I mean, I didn't like reach in to see if their kidneys were still there. But over seventy five, we had to leave because the orphanage director caught on to what we were trying to do, and he he told us we had to leave. Um, but they had incisions on their backs, and at that time. Kidneys were selling for $31,000 per kidney, um, mostly being um, taken to Brazil, I was told. Um, when I discovered this, I hired um, the, the hospital guard. At the, uh, He's gone now, so I'm not going to get him in trouble. But I didn't think anybody was going to believe my stories, even though I had – and the, the photographer – told me that Time Magazine would not print those stories. But he asked me, would you mind if I sold those pictures to Stern Magazine? And Stern Magazine, like I said, is a European magazine that's much like Time or Life. So the, all those pictures were published. And I think that um, we sent them to you. Did did you see those pictures? Yeah, well, I think just just now, and it's it's really very difficult to to look at i mean bloody hell some of these things so yeah terrible and where, and just the and way where that, you, you know where you see me on the floor kneeling b- beside that child that's jerry oh, i'm so sorry for what you went through i mean my, what does it feel like in, in being there um you know i usually don't have any emotions until i get home um I don't think very much because I, I can't, I can't get, I can't do my job and I can't function if I start crying and getting upset. So I wait till I get home and I start processing things then. You know, right now I'm sitting in my beautiful home safely and I can talk about it, but you know, going through it, you just go, you just do it. You know, you just do it. You, I knew that if I could prove with photographs and videos that an, an, um, an enormous amount of children stacked up like that in 30 days is something's going on. That's not the only hospital and it's not the only morgue. Those organs were being harvested in that hospital. That's why there were so many children every month, and it happened every month. They would clean out the morgue, and I actually followed. I had, um, you know, I, I've i worked a lot with um, UN people, and I, I was renting an apartment with uh, a bunch of UN um, men and women during those years. And I, they're, they're like Navy SEALs, these guys. They're, they're amazing. So I asked them if they would help me figure out a way to do kind of um, an investigation about how do you get rid of 300 babies' bodies every month? Where are they going and where are they hiding them? So with advice, um, we hired the guard in front of the general hospital, paid him handsomely. Um, the average salary in Haiti back then was $2 a day. Um, I was paying him $300 a month, which was a fortune. I gave him a camera um, and I asked him to go every day and take pictures of the morgue and to pay the guy who ran the morgue, which he was very willing to take the money. And then I asked him, could you let me know when they are going to clean the morgue out? I'd like to know how that's done and where they take them. So he called me and I was in the U.S. 
So I called my staff. I, I had one of my staff members in on this. He's a Haitian man, very brave, real tough guy. I asked him to take our truck and wait outside the hospital and follow the dump truck when it came out. So he followed the dump truck to Tetayen. Tetayen is um, uh, another, not such, such a bad slum, but it is a slum. And um, he followed it to the entrance of this slum and couldn't go any further because there were people, like gang got leaders that would notice if he went in and followed them. But he followed them just to that slum. And then four hours later at dawn, when the sun was coming up, the truck left without the bodies in it. So we knew they were doing, they were burying those children there. So I wanted to cause, um, I wanted to make this a, I wanted to make it, uh, it into the international news that this thing was happening. So I went to, um, Tatayan. I flew from Aspen to back to Port-au-Prince and, you know, did my work. And then I went to Tatayan with some money and told the people there that we would be willing to help them, um, with a water well because I can do water wells. People love to fund them. So I said, you know, I'd like to do a water well in your community, and I'd like to hire you to help me test the water here. And, oh, they said, no, no, don't test the water. And I said, why? They said, well, you know, um, they bury they bury bodies here, so our water is contaminated. And I said, oh, would you please show me where the bodies were buried? And lo and behold, trenches three feet deep still had the fresh mounds because I flew down within two weeks of my my staff telling me where they were taking these bodies. So there were mounds, fresh mounds, two weeks later that were maybe 10 city blocks long. And... I know that there were children under those mounds. So we didn't end up doing a water well there because yes, the, the land, it would have been contaminated, but we did help that, that village in other ways, um, because I wanted to keep my word. I've told this story. Every chance I get, I've written about this. I've, it's been in one of the most uh, renowned magazines in Europe, this story, with the photos that you're watching. I've gone to our U.S. ambassador in Haiti with the photos that I showed you. And the ambassador that I spoke to, um, I adore this woman. She's now the former ambassador, but I still talk to her once a week. She, she couldn't do anything. The State Department didn't want to hear about it. They didn't want to know about it. Awful. Tell me tell me about so so that's the organ trafficking and organ harvesting. Um how do we get from there to to proof of child sacrifice if you would if you if you would interview or want to interview some of the people that i know who have witnessed it i i called my friend um who is he's a diplomat in haiti he's well known to our government here um he told me with the prime minister of haiti so we were sitting in his living room in Patientville, one of the wealthy areas of Port-au-Prince, and I was about ready to quit my job there because I couldn't get anybody to help me. My contract with the government hospital, they kicked me out because I was telling these stories. I was no longer able to go in and help the abandoned children there. Um, I, I was just ready to quit. And... My friend, we'll call him John, invited me to his home, and he wanted to encourage me, and I showed up, and the Prime Minister of Haiti was there. She said, I want you to know that what you have been talking about is true. You're not crazy. It's true. She said, I'm resigning. I'm leaving this country. I've given my resignation. I'll never come back here. And who was that, the Prime Minister of Haiti? 
I can't tell you who it was, but it was a woman. And in the time frame that we're talking about, it was between um, 2000 and 2010. Let's say that, okay? And that's all I can say because this was a confidential meeting. And she said, please don't stop your work. She said, but be careful. Be careful. You are not going to be allowed to continue to talk like you're talking. And, you know, I don't care. You know, I really don't care. I don't have children of my own. I have adopted, um, I'm the legal guardian, my husband and I, of 119 children. Most of them are what they call Coco Bays. They're, most of them are disabled children. Um, and we take more in every time one passes away due to, you know, their diseases. We take another one. And we will continue to do that. Um, long after I'm gone because our organization is, you know, it's, it's there for the long haul. Um, Haiti won't kick us out because we are one of two organizations that take, um, disabled children and they don't want, they don't want to take care of them. And now that, now that people know that they euthanize them, um, they're not able to do that so freely anymore. Wow. So it makes a big difference. So I gather with, with, with the case of, you know, child sacrifice, um, there's a long history of sort of voodooism and sort of uh, Central African religions yes. mixed with Catholicism. And it's sort of mixed and gone a bit. You did well, your homework. It's different. <laughs> That's yeah. exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. In the Catholic religion, um, there are saints that are worshipped, you know, not worshipped, but, you know, they're they're given honor to. In the voodoo religion, they have loas, and these loas are different demons. They won't say that they're demons, but they're demons. And in our village, um, we started, we knew that the women in our village were letting their disabled children die. And they would take the disabled person to our priest, who I visited, saw some horrible things, and uh, I wrote about it in my book in detail. And uh, he encourages these women that if they pay him, they are allowed to take their child to a place called Luli and throw that child off the cliff into the ocean. And they're, if they pay him, it's not a curse. They're free and they're rid of the child. So I, um, have this physical therapy center for disabled children inside of our orphanage village, which is about 20 acres. And we have a lot of facilities there. So I, I sent out people on donkeys with megaphones up into the mountains where there's probably 20,000 people up there uh, living in the mountains and on megaphones with t-shirts on their uh, backs with a phone number on the back of the t-shirt and on the megaphone in Creole saying, if you have a disabled child, do not harm it. Do not, I said give it away, but I really meant kill it. So we started getting phone calls because keep in mind in Haiti, cell phones are given away by a company called Digicel. And I don't know if they still do it, but they did back then. And they're free. So people are forced to buy minutes, but the minutes are cheap and almost everybody has cell phone, even if they're dirt poor. So people started calling us and we would invite them to come to the campus and we would take care of their disabled person and feed them while we did physical therapy on these kids. And most of the time, it was really only club feet or a crooked arm or leg or, you know, a, a deformed hand or something. And in the cases of the club feet, it was very easy for us to, you know, do braces for, you know, a long period of time and teach them how to keep bringing the child back. And we would pay for the donkey ride or the dirt bike ride to get them there. So we had all of these women starting to come to us. They'd get their nice free meal. If they wanted, they could take a shower. There's no running water in the, in the village um, and they could sit around all day and talk to other women who had Cocoa Bay children 
And they started realizing that there was a real community that about 15% of the people in that village ha- had a disabled child. You know, they don't have prenatal care. So a lot of things can happen. So this community of women became very uh, a strong group. And even though they were still somewhat ostracized from their villages, they were getting treated royally by coming, having a meal, taking a shower, and watching their child be cared for by our doctors, our therapists, and given all the free medicine and treatment they needed. Um, I There's an organization who supports us in this work, um, Jack Nicholas, his foundation pays for all of that. And so we we can do it for anyone who wants it. So now we have this massive community of women who have started talking to me freely. And I've asked them, can you tell me what they do at Luli? And they told us, that's how I know about the priest, that they pay the priest and he um, sanctifies, you know, getting rid of the child without a curse. So this is still happening because not all women want to take the time to come down the mountain and, you know, have their child treated. Some some would rather just get rid of it. Oh, my God. It's horrific. And it makes me wonder about humanity. Um, Susie, what can people do to help your what you're doing? HaitiChildren.org is my email. Uh, or sorry, Susie at HaitiChildren.org is my email, and I'm probably going to get a lot of hate mail. But I can everything I'm telling you, I can prove. And if you ever want to interview other people about this, who probably won't want their, you know, face seen, but that they'll talk. Um, and then HaitiChildren.com is our website. We have to we have to raise funds to continue the work, and we're saving little kids. I wish that Haiti was safe enough right now for anyone who wanted to come and visit us to come because only two years ago we were bringing people to stay with us and to see the kids that I found in that back room near the morgue. And they're walking around the campus. There are little ambassadors. Some of them are in wheelchairs. We've built sidewalks so they can go anywhere they want. Um, they go to school. We've built schools. We feed over 3,000 school children right now in the area. And, you know, our work is really important. It really is, Susie. And I, I'm, ama- I'm just amazed by what you do and in awe of you. So thank you oh. so much for the work you do. And thank you for being on the edge. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Susie, for coming on the show. Hope you guys got something from that one. Do go support her. Make sure to hit the like in the video. I think that helps spread it around. I think this needs to be brought to light. Thank you so much for watching. Keep watching. There's things popping up over here.